So Adventure Time Fiona and Cake recently concluded, and although I'm a week late to the party, I do want to share my experience with this beautifully crafted 10 episode saga with you guys. Now, disclaimer, I'm going to be discussing a lot of plot details, so if you have not seen the series yet, and you don't want to be spoiled, this is your one and only chance to click off the video and run as far away as possible. Like, don't stop running. Like, I better not see you back here again. You know, it's truly remarkable how Adventure Time has captured all of our hearts over the years. It has managed to stay true to its core while also adapting and maturing alongside its audience. I'm honestly super grateful to have been part of the millions of fans who grew up with this series and aged alongside it. It's also a delightful experience to see the creators not only filling in the missing pieces of the Adventure Time universe, but also enriching it with new characters and deeper explorations of familiar ones. So. How does Fiona and Cake fit into this universe, or I guess multiverse? Does the show manage to captivate my cold, brittle heart just like the original series? Or is it a giant brown stain on the white Adventure Time bed sheets? <laughs> Well, I'm here to answer those questions, Dave. So the story of Fiona and Cake really begins before the spin-off series itself. Now, towards the end of the Adventure Time episode, Fiona and Cake and Fiona, something mysterious happens while the Ice King is asleep. A peculiar pink red beam envelops the Ice King, containing the characters Fiona and Cake within it. Now at the time, this event was puzzling, and its significance became clear only after the Fiona and Cake series began. You know, as it turns out, Prisma, a character known for granting wishes to others, decided to do something unusual for himself. He decided to create an unauthorized universe, a decision he wasn't allowed to make. To keep this universe a secret, he hid it within the mind of the Ice King. This universe was originally filled with magic and thrived, but everything changed during the Adventure Time finale when the Ice King returned to his original form as Simon, losing his magical abilities. This transformation had a profound effect on the universe within his head, robbing it of its magic as well. Consequently, the inhabitants of that world completely forgot about their magical origins. Now fast forward to the present, and we find Fiona in a situation that many of us can empathize with. She's an average young adult living a pretty mundane life, struggling to make ends meet, moving from one job to another just to support herself and her faithful cat, Cake. But deep down, she knows there's more to life, a greater purpose waiting for her. At least, she believes so because she keeps having these dreams about an ice prince. Now, meanwhile, in the contemporary world, Simon Petrokov occupies his days educating people about the bygone era before the Great Mushroom War. However, he finds himself discontented with this existence. In his present form, he feels like an outsider in a world brimming with magic, a world that doesn't quite align with who he once was. You know, that crazy bastard that shot ice out of his hands. Simon's also yearning to open a portal to reconnect with Betty, or, er, er, excuse me, <clears throat> goal, Betty. However, his attempts take an unexpected turn when, instead of reaching his intended destination, Cake and Fiona cross over into the Adventure Time universe, which creates a lot of problems for Prismo. Amidst these unfolding events, we're introduced to the central antagonist of this miniseries, Scarab. He's a god auditor with the peculiar task of traversing the multiverse to ensure that deities and cosmic entities are adhering to the rules and regulations. Scarab's meticulous duties lead him to uncover Prismo's creation of an unauthorized universe a revelation that becomes his sole mission. Scarab is determined to locate this universe and exploit it as evidence of Prismo's unworthiness to hold the coveted position of Wishmaster. Scarab sees this as a way to seize the role for himself. So, Scrabby Dabby Doo decides to play a game of cat and mouse with Fiona, Cake, and Simon who traversed through the multiverse to find a new magic crown to grant Simon his ice powers back in order to fend off the Scarab and to return magic to the Fiona and Cake universe. Now thankfully, however, that's not the ending that we received. Instead, we are handed one of the most beautifully crafted endings in animation. In fact, I, I cried a little bit. I cried out of every pore and hole of my body. Yeah, take that any way you want. Now, I've provided a fairly concise summary, but the show is incredibly deep, filled with lore, and includes numerous details and subplots that I haven't even touched on. So if you have not seen the show yet, well, what are you still doing here? What, what are you doing here? I told you to run away, damn it. But seriously, I, I really recommend giving the series a watch to fully appreciate its richness. So what did I think of the series? Well, I'm glad you asked, Billy. But before I give you my answer, I want to hear from you guys who have seen the show. How did you enjoy Fiona and Cake? What was your most memorable moment from the miniseries? Leave your thoughts down in the comments below. I'll try to heart react and respond to as many as possible. Well, I particularly enjoyed how Fiona and Cake managed to expand upon both old and new characters, worlds, and plots in the series, like the farm world timeline. 
Fiona and Cake offered a lot of insight into the current state of Farmworld Finn, the Destiny Gang, and society in the aftermath of the Snowman and Lich Saga. I never thought that we would see that particular world again, so having it back is just awesome. Oof, sorry Farmworld Finn, yikes. Now apart from Farmworld, it was intriguing to explore other alternate universes within the multiverse, such as the Vampire Universe where Marceline took a different path due to Simon's absence. It really raises questions about the consequences of altering the past and its impact on the future. You know, if Simon had been there for Marceline, it's possible the vampires could have been prevented, mirroring the events in the original Adventure Time universe. It also truly really breaks my heart that the Martin in this universe, Finn's dad, is just completely wasted in a matter of seconds via a trap orchestrated by Marceline. Now, usually, I would be saying some pretty nasty, horrendous, and dangerous stuff about Martin right now, mainly because I feel like he's just the biggest ass in the Adventure Time universe, but this particular scene has quite an emotional impact. It's noteworthy because despite Martin's usual questionable character traits in parenting, or in layman's terms, Martin is a giant piece of sh** and a terrible father, in this universe, this version genuinely appears to care for and treat baby Finn with a lot of kindness. In fact, he's super sweet and really nice to everyone. It's just really heart-wrenching to see given the improved version of his character in this universe. Ah, may you rest in peace, you wonderful Martin variant. The show's opening was also exceptional. I admired how it began with the familiar Adventure Time style, only to transition into something entirely unique. The theme song is also really catchy as well, in fact, it's currently stuck inside of my head. I was humming the theme in the shower the other day and it was really driving me crazy, which ultimately means that the song is doing its job. It's trying to lure me back for a fourth watch of the series. And speaking of music, the soundtrack takes you on quite an emotional journey too. I have to say my personal favorite song from the series was the love song between Betty and Simon. I believe it's called Everything in You featuring Half Shy, and it struck a deep chord with me. Other incredible songs from the series include Winter Wonder World, Part of the Madness featuring Rebecca Sugar, and of course, Not Myself featuring Zuzu. The entire soundtrack is on Spotify if you guys want to give it a spin or two, or 10. Don't stop listening to it, ever. It's, it's really good. I found it quite heartwarming to witness the evolution of Fiona and Cake's relationship starting as pet and owner, or just roommates, but gradually transforming into a deep and genuine friendship. While one could argue that they were already friends, it's very clear that their bond grew stronger over the course of the series. The pacing of the series was marvelous, which is a word I don't use often, but I might use it later in this video if you know what I mean. Wink wink. Personally, I did not get bored even for a moment. The show was consistently engaging and never felt slow, uninteresting, or monotonous. The recurring themes of love, sadness, heroism, companionship, renewal, loss, and most importantly, acceptance and understanding add to the special appeal of the series too. I appreciate how the creators tailored the series for those who grew up with Adventure Time, rather than targeting it at children who might not be familiar with the show. To truly grasp the plot of Fiona and Cake, you need to have experienced Adventure Time, and the specials as well, which I believe is well worth it given how fantastic the miniseries turned out. Additionally, I found it amusing that many of the characters I grew up with now incorporate more mature language into their dialogue, which adds a certain charm. <laughs> His own ass? <laughs> Quiet! Sorry. While they aren't dropping f-bombs or anything, hearing Simon casually say ass is certainly a noteworthy and enjoyable change. I'm so used to Tom Kenny voicing a lot of characters in children's cartoons, like Spongebob, and of course Adventure Time, and although I've heard him say some very gnarly stuff in Brickleberry, visually seeing Simon Petrikov mouth the word ass is just hilarious to me. There's also a lot of blood in the series. Now call me a psychopath, but the blood was a nice touch. Now speaking of marvelous, to my surprise, a mention of The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack, a series I haven't even thought about in years, really added a delightful touch of nostalgia. It's also amazing to see this miniseries and its creators pay homage to a show that really kickstarted a lot of people's careers in animation. You know, a good amount of people who worked on Adventure Time, including Pendleton Ward, worked on Flapjack, so seeing this acknowledgement of that classic series is just amazing. In fact, at the time of me working on this video, Adam Muto confirmed that he wanted to have a crossover with Flapjack for an entire episode, but that idea was unfortunately shelved due to the series only receiving 10 episodes. Although I am very much happy with the way that Fiona and Cake turned out and wouldn't change a thing about it, I would have loved to see an entire episode featuring Flapjack 
Captain Knuckles and Bubby interacting with Simon, Fiona, and Cake. Roz Ryan voices both Cake and Bubby, so seeing how close the creators were to really being able to cross these projects over is insane. It honestly sounds like the creators and staff are somewhat interested in doing some type of Flapjack project again, especially if they wanted to include these characters for a full episode of Fiona and Cake. Obviously, I'm speculating, but maybe we're due for a new Flapjack special or something. I guess we'll just have to see. Also, the fact that Flapjack is a part of the Adventure Time multiverse is so hilarious to me. And before someone tells me that Flapjack is not canon, according to Prismo, the Flapjack universe has always been around. It's canon, boys. A wish made this funny shape, universe. This one already existed. Fiona and Cake skillfully strikes a pleasing balance between seriousness and humor. When it comes to comedy, the jokes in the series are hilarious. How could you bring a child into this world? It was an accident. The origin story of Betty and Simon had a profound impact on me as well. It's a profoundly beautiful love story, and while it's possible that Simon and Betty didn't always make the best choices, they both cherish their time together, hold no regrets, and appreciate the lessons they've learned. They've reached a place of acceptance and are moving forward in their lives. Well, Simon is. I don't really know about Gold Betty. I don't know what she does all day. Ooh, Simon with the Riz, damn. I'm also very happy that Simon finally received the proper closure and ending that his character deserved. He might have not brought Betty back, but he found a reason to continue pushing forward and that's truly admirable. Same with Fiona. Although she dreamt of her reality being magical, she eventually learned to accept that there are some really awful universes within the multiverse that make her boring, colorless, mundane world feel like a day at Six Flags. Okay, that was probably not the best way to word it, but you guys understand what I mean. You don't really know what you have until it's slowly disappearing into the white void. She basically came to develop a fresh sense of gratitude for the things she possessed. And I mean, her world is now canon in the multiverse, and now there's some magic in the world too, which is cool. I found it quite touching how Simon utilized his own story to console Fiona during her moments of sadness. Madness. These instances bring to mind how Simon once comforted a young Marceline, and it almost feels like the relationship between Fiona and Simon resembles a father-daughter dynamic, which is truly heartwarming, because, you know, Simon was always the best dad. Exploring Scrabby's relentless pursuit to expose Prismo and secure the Wishmaster position was intriguing. Meeting Orbo and gaining insight into the inner workings of the multiverse adds depth to the storyline as well. Scarab serves as a god auditor, responsible for ensuring that cosmic entities follow the rules, with Orbo overseeing him. Now, there was also mention of Prismo's unseen boss again. Now, I've seen some speculation online on whether or not Orbo is potentially Prismo's boss or not, so I figured I'd give you guys my two senses. I feel like Orbo and Prismo could potentially be equals. I mean, both characters are named after 3D shapes. But if anything, Orbo is probably like HR, maybe some form of upper management. He's someone above Prismo, but not exactly his boss, if that makes sense. At least that's how I've interpreted it. It appears as if both Orbo and Prismo most share the same big bad boss that everyone fears. So, who is the big bad boss? Well, Jesus, knowing our luck, it's gonna end up being the damn stag. Could you imagine the Adventure Time team pulling some crazy sh like this? I, I can see it now. A curtain falls, revealing the deer wearing a suit and doing that weird thing he does with his fingers again. Oh my, g g stop it. Jesus Christ. I don't know, maybe we'll learn about the boss in a future special or something. I'd also like to see some type of special based around this cosmic entity ranking and how everything is operated because it's just super fascinating fascinating to me. Like, who are these characters and what do they do and how are they intertwined with this system? Like, give me more. The incorporation of U1000 Plus was a delightful addition to the story as well, as it not only provided us with a deeper understanding of the state of U in a millennium's time, but also the extraordinary twist of Golbetty allowing Simon to inhabit Shermie's body to impart a lesson was truly remarkable. I really hope that the creators put together some type of special or miniseries for U1000 Plus because I really believe that the future of Ooh is super fascinating and deserves some exploring. While Finn didn't have a significant role in this miniseries, it was genuinely delightful to see him again. When it comes to Adventure Time spinoffs and specials, I'm also hopeful for another adventure featuring Finn as an adult. It was also nice to see Jake again for a segment, even though we all know where he goes afterwards. However, knowing that these two rascals eventually reunite makes me feel a bit better though. Let's talk about the animation. The animation is truly impressive, and it's safe to say that this is the finest visual presentation Adventure Time has ever offered. 
Speaking of animation, I also really enjoyed the incorporation of a different animation style in the Winter Kings song and the Casper and Nova story. I'm just a sucker for when shows mix in different mediums. Fiona and Cake utilizes multiple animation styles throughout the series, but very sparingly, which I appreciate a lot. The use of various animation styles for specific scenes really adds a fresh and distinctive touch to the series. As much as I appreciate shows like The Amazing World of Gumball for utilizing several different types of animation, I do enjoy how less frequent Fiona and Cake uses different styles because it makes their moments feel more special and unique. The storytelling in this miniseries is truly exceptional, and I'd go as far as to say that some of the subplots in this series surpass many subplots in the original series. Despite having only 10 episodes, the creators skillfully weaved numerous narratives into each episode. These include the arc of Gary and Marshall's romance, the growth of Fiona and Kick's friendship from being roommates or pet and owner, Simon's realization of the value of his life, and the enduring love between Jay and Little Destiny, despite Big Destiny's disencouragement. Speaking of Gary and Marshall, their story together is really romantic and I loved every single second of it. A minor detail, but it was truly delightful to see how enthusiastically Gary shared his pastry mentioned bakery kingdom idea, drawing parallels to the Candy Kingdom, and a genuine interest that Marshall displayed. Specifically, Marshall asked Gary how his pastries Choco Berry and Mr. Cupcake met, to which he basically begins to describe the plot of the first Adventure Time episode, Slumber Party Panic. Another standout moment for me was the Lich's destruction. Golbetty effortlessly annihilating the Lich emphasized the notion that in the vast multiverse, there's always something even more formidable. This scene is just a great example of the saying, never meet your idols. Really, it's a reminder that meeting your idols might not always lead to the outcomes you expect. Moreover, it was intriguing to witness the Lich appearing so defeated and perhaps even disinterested. It makes one wonder if sharing this Lich's life experiences with other Liches could potentially lead to a change in their ways. Oh, uh, who am I kidding? Probably not. Anyways, BAM! Lich Omelet! Seeing the Lich being turned into a Tetris block really makes my heart melt. I also appreciated the attention to detail in this series, like when the Ice King mentions that he hid his crown inside his drum set in one of the VHS tapes that Bimo plays. It's followed by a scene showing the crown inside the drum set and Fiona's gaze towards it. Personally, I did not notice Fiona looking at the drum set until my second viewing of this episode, so perhaps I'm making a bigger deal out of this than others, but I don't know, I, I just found it really cool. What's even better is how it was incorporated into the plot rather than having the characters just walk past the drum set without noticing the crown, which would have been a missed opportunity. And, and don't get me started on the backgrounds, oh my god, they're so detailed. Look, I could talk about this miniseries for days. It seems like I've only explored the tip of the iceberg. So, should I explore more aspects of Fiona and Cake in future videos? Please, share your thoughts in the comments below if that's something you'd be interested in. In conclusion, Fiona and Cake is a fantastic addition to the Adventure Time universe. What initially began as a simple gender-swapped fanfic inside of the Ice King's head in the larger series has now become an integral part of the multiverse canon. The series introduced us to new characters who faced trials and triumphs, while also allowing older characters to experience growth, find closure, and evolve. It's a beautifully crafted work of art, and I wholeheartedly recommend it to anyone who has already enjoyed all of Adventure Time. But for those who haven't yet experienced Adventure Time, I highly, highly encourage you to give it a go. Now, it might take a few months to journey through both the main series and distant lands, but trust me, it's a universe well worth immersing yourself in. In fact, you should probably just start now. Like I mentioned previously, I do not doubt that the creators are already planning the next Adventure Time adventure. So if you start now, you'll probably be caught up to speed before the next series or special launches. For those of you who stuck around until the very end of this video, thank you. I've got an entire video dedicated to the Lich coming out pretty soon, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Also, the Avenger Bros Iceberg is coming out soon as well. Hopefully next week, we'll see. But that's about it. If you guys enjoyed today's video, do me a favor and leave a like. Subscribe to the channel if you're brand new around here. Click the bell icon to be notified whenever I upload a brand new video. Follow me on all of my social links and join my new Discord server. All links in the bio below. Have a great day, everyone. And remember to please stop making Amogus memes.